Welcome to the Indianola First Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. Hallelujah. Well, I'm starting a new uh, series this week, and it's going to be kind of a mini-series, and we'll see how far it goes, but uh, I'm going to title it Dudes with Tudes, and uh, (laughs) it's meant to be a little funny, I guess. But uh, I want to kick off this series, and it's really going to cover a few of the most relatable men in the Bible, men who, for the most part, were our heroes to us in that they did some great things for God, men who obviously uh, were used but who were far from perfect. How many can relate with that? And instead of focusing on their triumphs, which we often do, I want to focus on those moments in their lives when their own humanity got the best of them, those moments when their attitudes needed needed adjustment. Have you ever heard of an attitude adjustment? Turn to your neighbor and say something about that. (laughs) You need one. I need one. Hope you had one recently. You know, whatever. (laughs) See, I've always believed that the measure of a person's success is not found in the lack of failures they've experienced, but how many times they were willing to get up from those failures. These dudes with tudes that I want to cover are those individuals that had attitude failures that we all, again, can relate to. And let's be honest, we've all had those moments when our attitude just plain stinks. I think that's why the Lord sought fit to put so many examples for us in the Bible. He wanted us to be able to relate and for us to understand that it is human to have those moments. But we can also live within his grace and mercy and get up from those failures and attain the victory he has for us. So over the next few weeks, I want us to look at, again, some of these dudes with toots, some men in the Bible who had some bad attitudes, but God used them anyway because of their willingness to let him adjust those attitudes. And you know, it's funny, God will do that for you. He'll adjust your attitude for you. How many know that that's really fun when that happens? (laughs) Not always, not always. And this morning I wanna start with a classic story, a man who definitely needed an attitude adjustment actually more than once, He was a man called of God for a purpose, and he didn't really appreciate what God was calling him to do and say. Jonah had the attitude of disgust. He was basically disgusted at what God had called him to do. So I want you to turn to the book of Jonah. It's right there between Obadiah and Micah in the Old Testament, or it's, you know, a click away on your phone. And let's start by going over some background as to what is going on in the the time period here. Jonah was a prophet of God in the Old Testament. Prophets were the very mouthpieces of God himself. They were, they were God's voice to the people, and it's important to understand that. As many of you know, God's people became divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. You can throw up that map if you would. You can kind of see it there. It's a little stretchy, but But you see that top blue part, that's the kingdom of Israel, and that's the kingdom of Judah below it, kind of in that mustardy orange color. And uh, during during King David's 40-year reign, 1011 to 971 BC, before Christ, and then King Solomon after that, the nation of Israel was a superpower of the world, and it was their high point. That was their high point in history. And afterward came years of steady decline. You can put that map back up there if you would. Just hold it up there. Steady decline and, and, and finally disaster. Disaster occurred. Israel divided into two kingdoms, and it was around 922 B.C. And we all know the words of Jesus, a house divided against itself can't stand. So there was division in the nation of Israel after King David, after King Solomon, and it led to political divide. It led to border divide. It led into two nations. This was Jonah's world. 750 to 800 years before Jesus was born, that's what we're talking about here, He was a prophet to the northern kingdom, Jonah was, the northern part during those days of that national division. And Jonah is special for a few reasons. He is one of the few prophets that was actually from the northern kingdom. Very few were from there. They were mostly from Judah. He was from the city of Gath-Hefer, which is three miles north of Nazareth, by the way. 
And this general area would later become known as Galilee. Just an interesting geography point. You might remember that after Jesus called Philip, Philip told his friend Nathaniel about Jesus, to which Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, the prophet Jonah did. And of course, Jesus did as well. Jonah is also only one of four prophets that Jesus mentioned during his ministry here on earth. And he even identified with them. The Pharisees weren't convinced that Jesus was all he claimed to be. And uh, even though Jesus had just cured a blind mute by casting the demon from him, the Pharisees said that they needed a sign if they were going to believe. And Jesus said to them in Matthew 12, 39 through 41, only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. Jonah was a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of Jeroboam II. And this is important to know because Jeroboam was an evil king. He was, however, successful in his material gains. He expanded the kingdom to a place where it hadn't been since the days of King Solomon. And the people enjoyed the wealth and the political success of this king, but they also became distracted from God. I wonder if our nation has become distracted with material wealth and felt like they've been blessed because they have wealth. I think it's important when you read some of these stories to plug yourself and our own situation into them a little bit and see the parallels because God begins to speak to you all sorts of ways as his word opens up to you. And I know when I talk, start, start talking about Jonah, it's always easy to go right to the, the part where he gets swallowed up by the great fish. Everybody's interested in that. Did it really happen? Blah, blah, blah. I, yeah, I believe it really happened. Literally. But the backdrop of what was going on with God's people in this time was so important. There was a reason that Jonah was a dude with the tood. So Jonah, he's called to be a prophet to God's people. An evil king is in power, but the people are enjoying his success as it's making them wealthy and gives them a sense of national and political security within their world. That's what we all want, right? We just want some security. We just want to know everything's going to be okay, right? So everybody wants. North of the northern kingdom of Israel, north of their borders, was the powerful nation of Assyria. Assyria took over the northern kingdom of Israel in 1722 BC. So just a relatively short time after Jonah was prophet. I had a hard time, again, studying uh, and meditating on this historical setting because it, it just kept happening. I kept thinking about us as a nation, the United States of America. I was thinking about the division that, that, that had separated them into two nations, and then was, in my mind, I was being drawn back to the extremely divided place that we find ourselves in within our own nation. I was thinking about the people of God back then and how success to them was often the determining factor as to whether or not they were in the will of God. In other words, if their king was successful, materialistically speaking, it meant for the most part that God was blessing them. And then I thought of our nation, the Christians that have become politically distracted. And I want, I want to clarify this this morning. I, I'm not saying we should be uninvolved. I believe the opposite of that. We should be very involved. But I'm getting to an age where I can finally say that I've seen some things happen before that are happening again. When Christians get their candidate into office, they often feel blessed and they, they get more comfortable, but when their candidate fails, everyone starts talking about, we gotta pray for the nation, fighting for the nation, we gotta take our nation back for God and such. And I'm just wondering, is it really just about a candidate? Is that all it's about in our own minds? We ought to be pleading the blood of our, over our nation no matter who is in office. We ought to be pleading the blood over our leaders no matter who they are. And I know there's turkeys in office. I get that. 
Doesn't matter what party you're from, there's turkeys in office, right? We need to pray for them. How many know that your citizenship is in heaven first and not here? And I love this country. I'm not saying anything against this great nation. I think it's the greatest nation that's ever existed. And I'll fight for it. But I'm a citizen of heaven first. And I want morally conservative leaders who are biblically sound in their doctrine and that are true constitutionalists as much as the next Christian. But our salvation as a nation, hear me, will never be found in a political party or a candidate. It's found as we succeed in our mission to build his kingdom right here within our own circle of influence as well as in our nation and even to the uttermost parts of the world. That is what we're called to do as citizens of heaven. And I think Jonah knew his country, that God's people were in trouble, and I I think he felt the, the weight of wanting them to hear the truth. I mean, nobody in Israel liked the Assyrians. They, they knew that this powerful nation was a threat to their way of life, but they were also getting really comfortable and even relaxing their stance to some degree as they put their trust in an evil king just because of the material wealth he brought them. I'm a pastor, and it's my desire to proclaim the word of God to you in a way that's relatable and in, in a way that will hit you right where you're at and hopefully bring about healthy spiritual change to your life. And I'm sure Jonah desired that as well, and probably with a hundred times more weight as he was one voice to an entire nation. And I can imagine him getting ready to speak to his people and wanting them to know how their materialism would end up, how putting their trust in an evil king would be their own demise. And I imagine how he prayed and believed that God, God's people would hear the Lord through his words and that they would repent and maintain their national security because of their changed hearts. But that's not what happened. Very, something very different happened. In Jonah 1, 1 through 2, the Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Ammonitai, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh, announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. Say what? I'm sure that was Jonah's reaction. Say what? I mean, in prayer, I I was seeking you, Lord, for a barn burner message to give your people, the people of Israel. But then you tell me, get up and go to the enemy? You tell me, get up and go to Nineveh? And by by the way, Nineveh was a huge city, about 120,000 people. It was the capital city of Assyria. And the Assyrians were a brutal people, an incredibly sinful people. They were not only hated by the Israelites, they were feared by them. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. But this is where we are are introduced to that wrong attitude of Jonah. Look what it says in verse 3, chapter 1 of Jonah. After God calls him to go to Nineveh, the capital of of Assyria. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Man, get me out of here. I don't want to be in his presence. I don't want to do what he says. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. Tarshish. He, brought, he bought a ticket and went abo- on, board, on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Man, isn't it funny how we think we can escape God sometimes? He tells us to do something and we just don't do it. Show that uh, map of Jonah's journey, if you would. It's already up there. Good. So you see over here where it says Israel, and you see where, where Jonah was from, Gath Heifer, and you see uh, uh, Jerusalem there, the northern kingdom of Israel there, and you see Judah there. There's no lines, but you can see kind of where the, the countries were divided. Well, Jonah goes right there to Joppa. It's kind of hard to see where the rig red A is. He gets to port, and he's going to go to Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is a part of the Assyrian Empire. They own all that in the north. But look at how far that is. In fact, it's, it's close to 3,000 miles. He's going to go 3,000 miles in the opposite direction. He's going to be a little obedient because he's going to go to Assyria. But he's not going to go to Nineveh, which is B over there in the far le- your far left. Or far right, I'm sorry. Far right. 
which was about 700 and some odd miles there, 25, I think. He's not going to go there. He's going to go the other way. Now, geography is important. Nineveh was way over here. Tarshish is literally as far away in the opposite direction as he, as he could get. Tarshish was like the end of the world, basically. It's so like the church. God tells us to do something, so we act in a way that's technically obedient going to Assyria, but in all actuality is disobedient because we don't know what we're told. Jonah went to the right country but was going as far away from the city of Nineveh as he could possibly get. And I say that the church is like this because we often pat ourselves on the back for being so obedient by doing what is good when we willingly hang... uh, hang true or full obedience out to dry because we avoid doing what's best. And let's be real, good is always the enemy of best, isn't it? It's always the enemy of best. So we, we, we all know the story. Jonah sets out across the Mediterranean Sea. A huge storm moves in. The guys sailing the boat are freaking out. They're fearful of their lives. They are crying out to their false gods and throwing cargo overboard to lighten the load. And, and don't miss the fact that Jonah already has the attitude of rebellion here, okay? He's going in the opposite direction of the Lord that the Lord told him to go. So, so as the story goes on, we find out that during the storm, he's sleeping down below deck. So the captain goes down to him and, and is like, what are you doing? How can you sleep at a time like this? Why don't you pray to your God and maybe he'll pay attention to you and spare our lives? I mean, they were all crying out to their gods, but it's interesting, how God can, it, it's interesting how God can use anyone, isn't it? There's a picture here that, that I saw. This captain isn't one of God's people, yet he's pleading with someone who is to pray. It's like the world looking to the church for answers. Everything is falling apart, but those with God's message are asleep below deck. There's an attitude of indifference here, and I, I'm not willing to... I'm not, I'm not willing to do what God told me to do, so I'm just going to get depressed, hide myself away, and go to sleep. The heck with everybody. You can kind of feel that in Jonah, can't you? We've all been there a little bit. Then we see Jonah telling them it's all because of him and that they should just throw him overboard if they want to save themselves. Okay, now we're so mad and angry that we're just going to end our life. There's an attitude screaming in Jonah here. I'm not going to do what you asked of me, God, so you might as well just take me out. I would rather die than do what you are telling me to do. Well, the crew eventually gives in to Jonah's request. They throw him overboard, and the winds stop, and the waves subside. Jonah is then swallowed up by a great fish that the Lord sends, and he remains in that, that fish's belly for three days and three nights. And in church, this is called attitude adjustment. Can you imagine the smell? the sliminess, the loneliness. I mean, thinking that, am I just going to like get digested here? I mean, three days is a long time to be alone with your thoughts inside the belly of a fish. God doesn't allow him to just die. He gives him an opportunity to humble himself. And I just love it when God gives us, he loves us so much that he allows us to have those humbling attitude adjustments. He's such a good, good father, right? You're like, amen, yeah, until you get one. In chapter two, we get to read Jonah's prayer from the belly of the fish. It actually is the entire chapter. And if you ever find your place where you, in a place where you need and are receiving an attitude adjustment, it's a good prayer for you to pray. I should mention that it's also dripping with prophetic overtones in reference to Jesus as dying and going to hell in our place. Because just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. You could scripturally say, just as Jonah came up out of the belly of the fish and was spit out onto dry land, Jesus came up out of hell and was resurrected from the dead for you and for me. Chapter 3 starts with God calling Jonah a second time. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have for you. Okay, remember what happened? He went the opposite way. 
got thrown overboard by his own request, swallowed up by a fish. Fish spits him back up out on the, the, the shore that he started from, presumably. And God says again, okay, now I've saved you. You've been in the fish three days. You've gone through all this. Now you're going to do what I say? Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. I'm sure he just put a big smile on his face and was like, okay, Lord, you got me now. It was a city so large that it took three days to see it all. That's what the Bible says. Now, I might be embellishing here a bit, but Jonah's message to the people of Nineveh, it's not really like Peter's message after he was filled with the Spirit and 3,000 people came to Christ. From the Scripture, it says that upon entering the city, Jonah shouted. This is what he shouted. Verse, this is chapter 3, verse 4b. His whole message isn't even half a verse. 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. I did what God told me to do. Drop the mic, walk away. 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. I could, again, I could be embellishing, but there just seems to be an attitude in that. Because it doesn't say anything else. It's a whole message. It doesn't seem very thought out. It doesn't seem to have a lot of convincing within it. It's just like Jonah walks in obedience to the Lord, but does as little as he possibly can. And I admit it may not just, all of his words might not be recorded. I, I get that. But I see, I, as I see this in the context of the book of Jonah, I just see him as a dude with a tood. Here's the funny thing. They all repent. All of them. It says from the least to the greatest, they all repent. The king of Assyria steps off his throne, takes off his royal garments, and dresses himself in burlap. Then he sits on a heap of ashes just to humble himself. Another comparison here. God's man had to be thrown into the sea and swallowed up by a fish before he repented. These pagans hear one fresh word from, one, from the one true God and they all fall down in humble repentance. I think that's interesting. Why are God's people so hard-headed? Why does God have, what does God have to do to get his people to be obedient? Why are those who know the truth about who he is so quick to shut down when he's asking us to do something? Especially when those who don't know him are so ready to hear and receive, so ripe for the harvest. Can I tell you something, church? You may think that these fields outside these walls are impossible to breach as far as, as, far as harvest, that they're not ready, that they're not gonna receive the word, that they're not gonna hear uh, the, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, but at, that isn't really up to you. It's really not your call. The fields are ripe. The church just needs to be obedient. It's quiet in here. Well, I don't think anybody will will hear that message anyway. Have you seen how they are? Yeah. They're probably not half as bad as the Assyrians. In 40 days, Nineveh's gonna be destroyed. They all get saved. What a great picture of the fact that it's not up to you and how you say it and, and, and any of that. It's, it's up to the Spirit of God to reach people. All you need to do is be obedient. And hopefully we can be a little more obedient than Jonah here. The king even made a decree that the whole city was to fast. Even the animals weren't allowed to eat. I mean, he went to the, the nth degree with this. It was real repentance, and look what happened, Jonah 3.10. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. So the last chapter of Jonah begins with our dude with the tood again. Look at Jonah's response to God's mercy. Jonah 4.1. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. 
Jonah was angry about God's mercy being extended to the evil people of Nineveh. But before we get too disgusted with Jonah's attitude, consider this. Have you ever been so mad at someone that you refuse to act Christ-like towards them? Someone at work? Someone that you're driving next to? Who's not in your car, they're in the car next to you, you know? Your next door neighbor? Have you ever been so disgusted with a group of people that you told God to just take them all out? Maybe it was a ethnicity. That's a little racist, but maybe it was. Just take them out, God. I can't stand those people. Maybe it was a political group or political party. Maybe it was some kind of a resistance group. I don't know. Maybe it was just a certain news station that you felt wasn't telling the truth. You're just mad at them. Just take them out, God. I don't... I'm... Christians have the same attitude as Jonah all the time. In fact, if you are someone who doesn't believe that God can change someone else, then you might as well stop coming to church. Because we are in the helping change lives business. And maybe it's unlikely that an individual will change, but what is impossible with man is certainly possible with God. If we stop believing that people can change, we should close the doors of this church because we essentially are wasting our time. Well, you can't change what people are, Pastor Barry. You can't change their genetics. You can't change their upbringing. You can't undo the crap they've endured that's caused them to be the way they are. Well, guess what? You're right. I can't. We can't. But the power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ can do it. It can change people. It can change people. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And if you got to get through 10 people to get to one that will change, then do it. It's worth it. If you got to get through 100 people that won't change to find one that will do it, then go through 100 people and get to the one that will change. Because it's worth it. It's worth it. It's what we're called to do. I don't want to get in the way of what God wants to do. I don't want to get in the way of him changing people by just being another dude with a tood. Christians with this attitude, they don't pray for others. They don't give to missions. They don't volunteer for outreach. They just attach themselves to a church until the benefit for themselves runs out. They go somewhere else. Jonah says to God, I knew this would happen. I knew you were merciful. This is exactly why I didn't want to come here in the first place. He, he, said, he said to God, just kill me. I'd rather be dead than to live if you don't destroy Nineveh. Then he went out of the city and made a shelter to sit under, and he waited to see what would happen to the city. Notice, he's, he's rebelled, he's repented, he's obeyed. Now he's angry. His attitude just stunk. And yet, he represents us all because we've all had these same attitudes from time to time. God, just take us out of here now. I'd rather be dead than to see this happen, than to see my country fall, than to see this happen or this happen or this group be in power or whatever. I'd rather just get taken out of here. Then God showed Jonah mercy and he showed him his love. He provided a plant to grow up and it gave him shade. And that's just a great picture of God's love to his people. I mean, Jonah's freaking out, whining, complaining, being a punk. And God goes, eh, I'll, get, I'll give him some shade. He doesn't, he doesn't need to suffer too much. He's always trying to pull us back into him. Always pursuing us. Always trying to bring us back into the fold. And it says, Jonah was very grateful to the Lord for the plant. Well, good for you, Jonah. <laughs> then the book of Jonah ends like this, Jonah 4, 7 through 9. But God also arranged for a worm. You know, God's still doing his attitude adjustment here. He loves, and then he attitude adjusts, and he loves, and he attitude adjusts. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. 
attitude adjustment. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and he wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? God did all that because he was going to teach him something here. Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. (laughs) Wow. Again, we see this entitled dude with the tude. Jonah admits he's He feels entitled to this shade providing plant. And if he doesn't get to enjoy it, then he's got the right to be angry enough to die. And I think of the church. We feel entitled to this or that or the other. And if we don't get it, just kill me, God. Just take me out. Just just come back and, and take me home. You know, we're excited for the rapture. I'm excited. How many are excited for the second coming of Christ? Oh, man, I'm so excited for it. But guess what? It's hard for me to pray, God, come right now. Just come right now. And I've said those words many times. Just come now. Just come now. But when you really start thinking about it, if we get that way, then what we're saying is we don't really care about our neighbors that don't know yet. The church should really have the attitude of, God, just give us one more day. Just give us a little more time. We'll win one more to Jesus. We'll bring one more into the fold. Oh, I'm tired of this. Just get me out of here. It's okay to anticipate the rapture. It's okay to be excited about it. It's okay to look forward to it, no doubt. But Lord, give us one more day. Give us more time. Not because this worldly life is so wonderful, this earthly life is so wonderful, but because we need to win somebody to Jesus. Jonah 4.10, then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Should I feel sorry for such a great city? I think it would be wise for us all to remember that we are blessed by God as a nation and as a people because of God and not because of what we have earned or what we are entitled to. I mean, what more can God ever give you than the gift of his son and the shed blood of Jesus. What more could he give you than that? Can I pick on us a little bit this morning? Maybe I already have. There are all sort of at, sorts of attitudes that we have that aren't godly. Our attitude towards people who won't work. Our attitude towards Again, certain political parties, attitude towards illegal immigrants, our attitude towards homosexuals, our attitude towards other religions, our attitude towards those that march for their right to sin in horrific ways. And sometimes people do things, these, in the, within these groups do things that make us so angry. And I'm not saying they're right, and I'm not saying we should accept it. I'm not saying that we should consider what they believe is truth equal to ours or anything like that. Truth is truth. You know where I stand on that. We should always be the declarers of what is right and wrong. I'm not even saying that we shouldn't be bold and boisterous about the truth. I'm saying that change can and will happen when the church gets off a soapbox approach and starts praying for God to give them inroads to share the love of Jesus with those very same people. When they lay down their bad attitudes, the church, when we lay down our bad attitudes and start listening to God, amazing things can happen. If Jonah can say 40 days, Nineveh's going to be destroyed, and the whole city, 120,000 people get saved, What will he do with a blood-bought, because we're on the other side of the cross, what would he do with a blood-bought, spirit-filled Christian that just is given over to do whatever he tells them to do? It would be amazing. I want to pray this morning, and I'm, I'm ending a little early, but I talked enough. I don't want to be a dude with a tude. Or a dudette with a tude. Is there any dudettes? Is there any dudettes who have tudes? 
Some of you? Oh, you're pointing? Don't point at, point at yourself. Don't point at other people. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so judgmental. <laughs> Let's stand. And I'm going to do this today. Pastor Jerry, would you just close us in prayer? Father, I want to thank you this morning for Pastor Barry's message, for this word. God, I pray that you give us a heart of compassion for people. Lord, not for our agenda, not for the things that we want to get behind God necessarily, but Lord, Lord, not even for the things that seem good, God, in this world, but Lord, we want to have your heart for people. So Lord, I pray, God, as we go out from this place, God, you'll give us an attitude that wants to see people come to know you, even though we don't agree with them, even though we don't believe the way they live. God, a heart that sees beyond those things and sees the condition of their soul. Father, because we know that above all things, Lord, you want them to have the best relationship with you that they can have. So, Lord, empower us as we go from this place. God, to find those people who need to reach you and need to see you and need to know you. And, God, give us opportunities, Lord, to speak your truth in a way that meets them where they're at, in a way that shows love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.